Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our kickoff session for 2023 for the UNC Leinberger Cancer Network Advanced Practice Provider Live Webinar. I hope everyone's new year is off to a great start. Today is Wednesday, January 18th. Uh, our team is standing by. If anyone's having technical difficulty, please reach out. You can contact our team at 919-445-1000 or send them an email on the screen. Um, our team is standing by to help out. Our um, session this afternoon will involve some Poll Everywhere questions, and you'll also use Poll Everywhere to submit questions to our speaker. You can join via the web by going to pollev.com and entering UNC LCN to respond to the activity. Um, if you participated in these before, you know you can also um, answer questions through Poll Everywhere app on your iPhones or Android phones. So to claim continuing ed credit, participants must attend using one of the following, um, Zoom with the slides and video components, or at one of our designated sites with a site coordinator. Unfortunately, joining via Zoom using phone audio only um, does not qualify for continuing education credit, um, nor does watching via the media site. So to claim your credit, you must view for at least 50 minutes or more, and then fill out the evaluation, select your certificate, and you can claim credit within seven days. So after the webinar, just a quick reminder, if you can um, not uh, um, disconnect right away, hang on for a minute for our team to end the Zoom video, and this ensures that your um, attendance is recorded. So check out learn.unclcn.org to see all of our great series for continuing education credit. We have our other series, the patient-centered care, the research to practice, and the Southeastern American Indian Cancer Health Equity Partnership. There's live webinars. If you've missed past ones and you're interested in topics, um, you can um, check them out. They're self-paced online, and you can still obtain continuing education credit. I'm very excited to have Denise here to kick off 2023 to talk with us about the value of integrative medicine in oncology care. So Denise Spector is an oncology nurse practitioner and is also clinically trained as an integrative health and medicine practitioner through the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. Additionally, she completed the University of Michigan's Integrative Oncology Scholars Program in May of 2022. Denise has been an oncology nurse for over 35 years and has been involved in research focused on lifestyle, behavior modification for healthy promotion, risk reduction, particularly among breast cancer survivors. So thank you, Denise, for being here. So outside of your professional bio, um, anything um, personal or fun you'd like to share with our audience? Thank you again, Tammy. Thank you earlier be on as the kickoff for the series. Um, and I just want to thank Tim and everyone as, as well and everyone who's on the Zoom today. But I, I would say that one new thing that had happened in the past year that I, something I thought about for many, many years was taking harp lessons. So I started taking harp lessons last year and it's really starting from ground zero without any ever having played an instrument. I don't know how to read music. So it was learning how to read the music first and then strumming my my beautiful harp. And I actually fell in love with it and ended up purchasing a harp. So um, yeah, my inspiration was though a classical tune that I love called uh, Claire de Lune by uh, Debussy. So um, that's one different thing. I hope yeah, to, that, um, yeah. That is, that sounds that. like a lovely new hobby. It is indeed. <laughs> um, so this is an example of what your Poll Everywhere questions will look like. Um, we will circle back to this um, momentarily. Here are your disclosures for today. 
And so our first practice poll everywhere question is what one word comes to mind when you hear the term integrative oncology? And you could go to poll everywhere and um, respond there. So we look forward to your responses. Anything coming through yet? Nope. I don't see anything coming through. Could be a phrase, just a short phrase. Oh, here they come, teamwork. I was going to say something I, I think about is, you know, holistic. Mm -hmm. Thinking mind, body, spirit. Acupuncture, nice. Here comes some great oh. ones. Love it. Like management. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness. Yes. Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, great. Thank you all for sharing. So I will now turn it over to Denise. Thank you again for being here. Okay. Yeah, thank you everyone for giving some wonderful uh, words to your thoughts on integrative oncology. Definitely they all apply. And I saw Carmela on there. Um, I'm wondering if that was in reference to a community acupuncturist that uh, I often refer to and I think some of you do as well. But anyway, we'll go ahead and just go over the learning objectives to define integrative oncology, um, to state three reasons. Oops, excuse me, I just switched off. My apologies. To go back to, I might need help getting back to my my full um slides. Can you all see me okay? Because I switched off to... We, we yeah. sure can. I could okay. see you and then you're on your learning objective slide. Okay, for some reason I lost my ability to advance the slides. Not sure what I clicked to get out of that. Um, so I can move them for you, Denise. Okay, but I, unfortunately I'm not able to even see the slide fully. Okay, here we go. So sorry about that. State three reasons why a patient affected by cancer might seek out integrative medicine approaches to care. Describe three evidence-based integrative medicine strategies for cancer-related fatigue, something we see all of the time. And identify three integrative medicine modalities that may help improve mood and reduce anxiety, among others. There are some others. So, um, you know, what's the difference between integrative medicine for oncology patients and alternative medicine. I think we so often have many of our patients coming to us with bagfuls, basketfuls of supplements, hearing from their friends, their families that, oh, I heard this cures your cancer. And we all know that there is no supplement out there that is going to cure a cancer. But this is something I hear all of the time. And there are even those patients, we all have had them where they make a decision maybe to opt out of conventional treatment and go purely to alternative medicine. So I'll get into those definitions. So the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine came out with a definition for CAM is what most of us have heard it referred to as, and that's what's often used in the literature, but I will make the distinction. More studies, more um, literature is starting to use the term CIM, which is complementary and integrative medicine as opposed to CAM, because it can get very confusing. So I think we all know complementary practices typically refer to the use of non-mainstream approaches along with those conventional medical approaches versus alternative, which refers to those 
non-mainstream medical approaches instead of, and that's not what we do in integrative medicine. And I want to give you just a general definition of integrative medicine that came out of the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, where Andrew Weil, one of the frontier forefronts of integrative medicine in the U.S., uh, has his program and training program as well as program for patients. It's a healing-oriented practice that takes account of the whole person, including all aspects of lifestyle. Emphasizing the therapeutic relationship between practitioner and patient is informed by evidence and makes use of all appropriate therapies. And then we move to the definition for integrative oncology. And this is a definition that came out of the Society for Integrative Oncology in 2017. And for those who may not be aware, this is an international multidisciplinary organization that was founded back in 2003. So it's 20 years now. So it's been around for a couple of decades. Their definition is integrative oncology is a patient-centered, evidence-informed, field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and or lifestyle modifications from different traditions alongside with those conventional cancer treatments. Integrative oncology aims to optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across the entire cancer care continuum and works to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during, and beyond their cancer treatments. And I think we all know the um, elements of evidence-based or evidence-informed practice with the three domains, research evidence, which we have as a base. And then we also, of course, have to take into consideration clinical expertise. And another really important component are the patient beliefs, values, and preferences. As we all know, this, especially culturally, too, cultural aspects that come into play when patients and their providers are making decisions about um, moving forward with treatment plans, we um, need to factor this in because it's not all just the evidence. And we may have to just move with the patient where they're at during that time. And then the three dimensions that came out of the definition for integrative oncology, lifestyle changes, mind-body practices, and natural products, which we'll get into in a little bit. So I did want to just kind of give a kind of broad overview of CAM use or CIM use among cancer survivors. And while the studies have varied widely in um, reports of use among cancer survivors, Estimations ranged between 60 to 80% in many of the studies for this use. One study actually reported up to 91% used at least one modality during treatment, and another reported up to 75% among those who were post-treatment. And many of the studies have been done among individuals with breast and prostate cancer, and I think that's um, typical, right, because those are two of the larger populations. Those are the groups that we see have more of a tendency to enroll in research trials. Although there were a few studies that I looked at in cancer, colon cancer survivors and during treatment and post-treatment as well. And um, it seemed that for CAM use, one of the highest percentages was use of dietary supplements, nutrition, followed by mind body practices, spiritual strategies, and then relaxation techniques. And characteristics of individuals for these studies most frequently reporting use of CAM or CIM are females more than males, younger versus older adults, individuals with higher income and higher education. However, I do want to add a caveat here because I, again, because so many of the patients who enroll in the trials tend to have higher SES, we're, we're missing this whole lower SES population who really has a tendency probably um, just as high, if not higher in some instances, of using some type of traditional type of CAM practice. And oftentimes I find with different cultures uh, using a lot of different supplements. So I don't think the studies are really capturing that. And then another important 
fact here is some studies have found non-disclosure rates about CAM used to their providers to be as high as 84%. So I think that that leads to the um, importance of asking our patients about their use of CAM because often I even hear from patients when they're rattling off their list of supplements, I, you know, did you talk to your provider about this? And sometimes they haven't mentioned some of the supplements that they're using. So an important piece to capture, as we know, some supplements can have interactions with their cancer therapies. So here we come to another poll. What are three of the most common reasons why someone with cancer might use complementary integrative medicine modalities? A, relaxation, improve quality of life, prevent recurrence. B, improve general well-being to treat side effects of cancer treatments and increase immune function. C, improve quality of life, better sleep, increase immune function. Or D, relaxation, prevent recurrence, and as a last resort. So I'll give you time to kind of um, add some things in the poll. Uh, excuse me, add your answers to the poll here. And as they come in, we'll be able to see. Excellent. Yep, 100%. D is the answer. Terrific, everybody. So, yeah, this is just shown, but everybody knows it, so I don't have to read it. Um, three of the most common reasons. And then four, uh, uh, there's one at the bottom five, preventing other non-cancer diseases. Some people do want to do what they can to prevent other comorbid conditions. So I do want to highlight that there are some guidelines out there. I know some of you may be aware of these. The SIO, Society for Integrative Oncology, actually came out with breast cancer clinical guidelines back in 2017. And ASCO, the next year, actually endorsed these guidelines. So we're not just, as integrative practitioners out there, not... Um, getting the input from other national cancer organizations. And I must say too, that NCCN, some of the recommendations that they provide in their supportive care guidelines parallel those that are recommended in the clinical guidelines for, for breast cancer um, during both during and following cancer treatment. And I did want to just kind of put this up. I'm not going to spend much time here. And I think we all have been educated on the grade level for looking at evidence for the strength of the evidence. And I just want to point to grade level A's, B, and C. A, there being a high certainty that the net benefit of a strategy is substantial. And we would want to offer, provide that service. And I'll be getting into some of those in, in a few slides as we move along. And then B, there's moderate certainty that the net benefit is moderate to substantial. So we also would want to offer, provide the service. And then C, there's at least moderate certainty that the net benefit is small. So we would want to offer, provide the services for those patients who are really interested in it. And within our professional judgment, we may think that it could be beneficial for them. And then I wanted to mention as well that just last year, actually the end of the year of 2022, a brand new guideline from SIO along with ASCO. So this was not only endorsed by ASCO, the two groups, national organizations came together to develop this integrative medicine guideline for pain management. And <clears throat> what they did was a, looked at a literature search that included both systematic reviews meta-analyses and RCTs published from 1990 through 2020. And they identified about 227 relevant studies. And basically down at the bottom highlighted recommendations were that acupuncture should be recommended for aromatase inhibitor related joint pain. So there is a modality that we know has some evidence for helping with this um, symptom side effect that plagues so many of our breast cancer survivors, and um, also some prostate cancer survivors and endometrial cancer survivors. And then acupuncture or reflexology, I'm not going to get into much about reflexology. 
as well as acupressure may be recommended for general cancer pain or musculoskeletal pain, hypnosis, and patients actually can be taught self-hypnosis that can be recommended for patients gone through procedural dis, um, procedures like bone marrow biopsies that can cause discomfort. And that massage is recommended for those experiencing pain in that palliative symptom management time and our hospice care. So more and more recommendations are coming out and ASCO and SIO are also currently working on a guideline around anxiety and depression management in cancer patients. So looking forward to that one coming out soon. And we're just gonna take a, just kind of a overview of several different integrative medicine approaches. And I have to say, it would take me a day to spend on each of these different um, strategies. So I'm just gonna go through some highlights for each of them to give a little bit of background around the relevance, around the value for them. And we talked a little bit about acupuncture for pain, but there, um, this was just kind of a comp compilation of a few studies looking at some evidence around acupuncture for other symptoms as well. And one study, uh, Lau et al. in 2015, found statistically significant findings for reduced cancer-related pain, as well as fatigue, nausea and vomiting, and just general quality of life improvements. And therapeutic effects for cancer-related fatigue in another study, as well as nausea and vomiting, and on leukopenia, which I think is incredibly interesting. If there's any way that we can help our patients immune, enhance their immune system, there, there is some emerging evidence that that actually may happen with acupuncture therapy, specific treatments that an acupuncturist would do. And then there's also some evidence for help with hot flashes and even hiccups. And I think, you know, many of us have had patients who've come up with these intractable hiccups that we don't have a lot of pharmacologic measures to help get under control. So keep in the back of your pocket the thought that, well, perhaps maybe acupuncture could help that because they are incredibly distressing. As you know, if you've had those patients who just can't get a handle on these hiccups. And then another study from 2017 in breast cancer patients found a significant reduction in many of the menopausal symptoms. However, it didn't show a ne necessarily a reduction in hot flashes. It did show a reduction in the severity of them. The patients were able to handle them a little more easily. And um, some of you already know, we have two medical acupuncturists here at UNC. I often refer to Dr. Chen with the Department of Family Medicine. He's been working with the Cancer Center for a number of years. And then Dr., and I'm not going to go ahead and even try to pronounce um, um, Paul's name. Well, I think he's referred to as Dr. Than, so I'm just going to refer to him as Dr. Than. He is with the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, but we do have those two options. However, there are some really great practitioners in the community as well. For, for patients who may live outside of the area that, um, and many of our patients, this is a, a statewide uh, network, and I often do refer patients to community providers that um, if they just can't get into UNC. Um, the one issue with acupuncture is often not reimbursed. However, there have been cases that patients do check with their insurance company and they agree to pay. So I always tell patients at least ask, but they can use flex spending or healthcare spending accounts for the cost of acupuncture. There's also a nice North Carolina acupuncture licensing board directory, which um, you can just plug in the city and uh, zip code to find practitioners who are licensed in North Carolina. Uh, again, very helpful for those patients who live outside of our catchment area of the RTP. I'm gonna flip back now. We mentioned um, uh, the cancer pain management summary. And I just want to, again, just mention that aromatase inhibitor related joint pain can be relieved through acupuncture, general pain, intermusculoskeletal pain, 
And they also, within that guideline, I didn't read that off in the, in the recommendation summary part, but there was even some emerging evidence where chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy may be helped with acupuncture. And then to look at evidence-based acupuncture and acupressure recommendations from those SIO guidelines for breast cancer. Even though they don't have guidelines for all cancers, I, uh, I think we can extrapolate from what has been found in the breast cancer population. This comes back to, again, because they're just the studies with um, many of these strategies included breast cancer survivors. So that's where most of the data is. So you can see level B, this is something we want to recommend um, for nausea and vomiting. Level C for the other symptoms, side effects that I've listed, such as anxiety, depression, fatigue, quality of life, pain due to AIs, vasomotor, hot flashes. And remember, this came out in 2017, so that review of the literature was done before 2017, before the review for the pain management. So I think the pain due to AIs is probably um, a bit higher than the level C in general. And then we'll move on to energy therapies. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this either. So we don't actually have an energy therapist at um, UNC, but it's not to say that there's some value to that. And I have recommended Reiki and some other modalities to patients who come looking for that type of strategy. Reiki uh, originated back in Japan in the early 1900s with its purpose is to uh, increase health by accessing what's termed the universal life energy, connecting to an individual's own healing abilities. And then Qigong has been around for many years, 2,000-year-old Chinese mind-body exercise, with qi meaning breath, and vital energy and gong meaning power. The idea is to transfer chi or energy from one person to another, from the practitioner to the patient. And you can see in one of the diagrams, kind of a demonstration of that being done. And then therapeutic touch, which is actually co-developed in the seventies by an American nurse and typically utilizes a non-touch transfer to help with the re restoration of balance and healing capacity. So just a little bit of evidence um, around, I've just chosen to look at Reiki, um, 2014 study, but it found that among 213 cancer patients receiving Reiki, and this was diverse cancer patients, but predominantly breast cancer, there was actually a greater than 50% reduction in self-reported distress, anxiety, depression, pain, and fatigue. And then in 2017, Chirico and others did an RCT of 110 pre-surgical breast cancer patients that focused on, on the Reiki compared to, uh, of course, a control. And they found a decrease also in anxiety and improvements in mood. So there's something to this. Uh, and patients anecdotally uh, have talked about the benefits for their Reiki therapy as well. And another study I just wanted to point to, this was done in the pediatric population. I know most of us are adult providers, but if there are any pediatric providers out there, this was a feasibility and efficacy study looking at the power of Reiki for reducing pain in children undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And it actually showed that Reiki did relieve some of the pain, reduce the intensity of the pain that these children were experiencing. So I think it's an important thing to remember. And this was, I guess, about 88, I think there were 88 sessions that they did. It was a small study. There were only nine patients, but again, it was a feasibility study. Um, but patients, these pediatric patients received the Reiki, uh, accepted it well. We know that stress and cancer has a tremendous stress has a tremendous negative impact on cancer and well-being but we know both positive and negative thoughts affect our health chronic stress has been associated with worse cancer outcomes and approximately 10 to 15 percent of cancer survivors if not more that's just one study 
that they suffer from some type of clinical mood disorder, such as depression or anxiety, and addressing stress through mental health counseling, meditation, and or exercise, such as yoga, could be vital to their well-being and longevity. And I um, was happy to see that somebody put meditation uh, up at the front with um, the word cloud for integrative oncology. So some mind-body therapies that can be thought of for use in um, patients going through the stress of cancer and cancer treatments, guided imagery, which is the use of a mental picture, thought, or feeling of some desired outcome, or of a place that typically provides a sense of calm and relaxation. If you look behind me, this is certainly my happy place, a tropical scene. Um, but for others, it could be something very different. And we need to be mindful of what works for them. Hypnosis. And I mentioned earlier, patients can be trained in help self-hypnosis. There are also some really good psychotherapists in the community that do hypnosis with patients around um, fear of recurrence, around stress, anxiety. And it's basically mental imagery, suggestive words used to help create a state of deep relaxation. And then meditation, there are many different forms of it, but basically it involves a focused concentration on an image, a word, or the breath, or some external object to distract the mind. And then there are various breathing techniques as well as progressive muscle relaxation and simple imagery that can be recommended to patients. So this to um, alludes to what I was just saying, the power of imagery and individualizing the scene. Because for one person who may find peace, serenity, ease with a tropical scene, someone else might find the same type of feeling looking at a mountain scene with a beautiful reflection of the mountains in a crystal clear lake. So again, um, if we're do doing that with patients, we need to find out from them what seems to be their joyful or um, calming place. So five key aspects of care when the use of some of these therapies may be beneficial. Obviously, following a cancer diagnosis, which we know is a time that leads to high emotional distress, coping with and reduction of treatment-related side effects, aid in the stimulation of immunity and other healing responses, and the reduction of cancer-related pain. And just that reminder that sometimes we so often go about our day so busy and we do need to remember to take a nice breath. And it's amazing the power of relaxation breathing and what it can do for reducing stress and anxiety. So there was actually a, a pretty large systematic re review done by Hall and others in 2018 that included 19 studies focused on fear of recurrence. The study found basically that many different forms of mind-body interventions can significantly reduce distress among a wide range of cancer patients and populations. So we know the power of mindfulness. And most of those were RCTs as well, I, I have to say. And then moving to looking at guided imagery and progressive muscle relaxation for clusters of symptoms. Basically, this study found a significant reduction among the intervention group who received guided imagery and PMR for um, lowering fatigue. And you can see this p-value is incredibly uh, low, 0 0.002, so st very st highly statistically significant, as well as for pain, highly statistically significant, and just for overall better quality of life, again, highly statistically significant. And there's a particular type of meditation that many um, have used, have heard of, a lot of studies around it, mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, as we call for short. 2019, there was a meta-analysis of 14 studies in breast cancer patients, found significant reductions in anxiety, depression, stress, fatigue, and, and improved cognitive function. And I think this is a really important one because there aren't a lot of strategies that we know can really help with that brain fog or chemo brain as some patients refer to it as. 
There's, there's not a lot. Exercise may help, but also some evidence now showing that mo- some of these modalities that are included in MBSR, it's mindfulness as well as meditation, as well as some yoga, some breath work as part of kind of a formalized or structured program in MBSR. And then in 2017, there was another review of six studies, mixed cancers and not just breast cancer. MBSR may have some effect on biomarkers of improved immune function, showed decreased IL-6 and decreased TNF in the serum of these patients who went through an MBSR program. I find that incredibly interesting as well. Anything we can do that may have an impact on improving our patient's immune function is a great thing. And then um, one other breast cancer study in 2014, this result I thought was interesting as well. It actually showed an increase in telomerase activity, the enzyme that is involved in telomere formation. And telomeres are those ends of our DNA. And often as we age, telomeres start to shrink, decrease in size. So this increase in telomerase activity indicates that um, there is less of the shortening of the telomeres. There's, there is actually activity to lengthen, in, in theory, the, the telomeres. And shorten telomeres and decrease telomerase activity is known as a marker for cellular aging and is associated with psychological stress. And uh, I won't spend much time on this, but this was another uh, large mindfulness-based intervention, uh, excuse me, study, it was a meta-analysis, looking at 29 studies, included over 3,000 participants, and those involved in some type of mindfulness-based intervention reported lower anxiety, depression, fatigue, stress, greater quality of life, and post-traumatic growth, which we know is so hugely important in our patients uh, and the patients who went through the intervention as opposed to the control group. So going back again to those SRA guidelines for breast cancer for meditation, we see level A evidence for all of these, for anxiety, stress, depression, and for improvements in quality of life. So we definitely want to recommend this to our patients. And for those who may not be aware, we do have a mindful moments program through integrative medicine, CCSP. And this is offered through our yoga therapist. She does one-to-one and sometimes kind of has uh, some group as well. Patients are interested in that. That can be through zoom or on the phone and to schedule, it's free of charge, but to schedule, you can go through Carly Bailey. I think most of you know Carly is our um, coordinator for integrative medicine, and Carly also is the coordinator for Get Real and Heal, as well as some other programs. And there's also, just as a resource, the General Integrative Medicine Program with UNC also offers training and MBSR, the 8 to 12-week program. So just giving you some resources um, for for that. If you are interested or, or your patients are interested, they can sign up. Most of them are online at this point. So we're coming to another poll. What are two evidence-based interventions for helping decrease cancer-related fatigue? And just looking at that poor little dog, many of us might be feeling this way since this latter part of the day at this point. So we have A, aerobic exercise, B, acupuncture, C, taking a two-hour nap, both B and C, or E, both A and B. Advance so we can see. In here. Aerobic exercise, most definitely. So um, even though taking a nap can be helpful, the the answer is aerobic exercise and acupuncture. So E, it's a great, nice work, everyone. Movement therapy is not going to spend a lot of time on this either because it's been lectured upon by Carly and some of her exercise physiology 
colleagues. But we know exercise is important. And a review of 66 studies conducted both during and post-cancer treatment results reveal majority had significant improvements in fatigue, cardiorespiratory function, body strength, body weight, functional quality of life, anxiety, mood, self-esteem, and on general symptoms and side effects, such as pain and even lymphedema. And it was once thought that patients, especially for resistance training, shouldn't do resistance training for lymphedema, but it's actually been shown to be helpful. And then the resistance training, a review of 15 studies, large improvements found for muscular strength and endurance, physical function, improvements in fatigue, and on other quality of life measures. Smaller improvements were seen in body composition, but some of that is just due to the fact that some of these studies weren't very long. It would take a longer period of time to start seeing increase in lean muscle mass or decrease in body fat. And then I just wanted to share this, this table that came out of a article um, from the American College for Sports Medicine, which put out exercise guidelines for cancer survivors a number of years ago. This is 2018. You can see that there's actual evidence on the relationship between physical activity and mortality in cancer survivors. And looking at the bottom part, first part is um, looking at all cause mortality, but cancer specific for breast, colorectal, and prostate, that there's moderate grade evidence there for reduced mortality, 38%. That is huge. So we should be recommending this for all of our patients. And I'm sure most of you are already doing that. And then just moving to yoga, yoga, which is an ancient Eastern spiritual practice, the goal of uniting mind, body, and spirit for self-awareness and improved health. Many different types exist. It happens to be probably one of the most studied CIM practices in oncology and an exponential increase in the number of studies for yoga and cancer patients over the past 10 years, suggesting many, many benefits. And yoga, for those um, I think most people know, it's a combination of physical poses, breath control, and meditation. So what do we know about yoga for symptom management in oncology? This was a nice review of the evidence in 2019, basically finding that there was significant efficacy of yoga for overall quality of life and fatigue. And with this study, there were trends suggesting the benefits of yoga for stress, distress, sleep, and cognition as well. And again, pointing to cognition, if there's anything non-pharmacologic that we can do for patients to help perhaps improve that chemo fog, brain fog, um, we should at least talk to our patients about it. And back to our SIO guidelines. This is the last one I'll go over uh, with the guidelines. But you can see for yoga, level B evidence for reduction and anxiety, distress, depressive symptoms. So we want to, as well as improvements in quality of life. So we want to recommend yoga to our patients who are open-minded to it, at least want to talk about it and talk about the benefits. Um, level C for fatigue and sleep. So we may want to recommend it for those as well. And we do have an outpatient gentle yoga program through UNC, provides virtual as well as in-person group classes to patients as well as their care providers. And um, while most sessions have been held over Zoom, recently there was an in-class added on Wednesdays. And while it is a free program for our patients, they do certainly um, accept donations. Shifting gears, because we still have um, a couple categories to go over, food is medicine. And we've all heard lectures from our amazing oncology dietitians on nutrition and cancer, so I won't spend much time on this either. But just know that uh, recommendations from national and international cancer organizations are around um, more Mediterranean style diet, predominantly plant-based diet has been associated with lower rates of some cancers such as breast and endometrial cancer. 
And one study of a Mediterranean-style diet actually found a 40% reduction in the risk of postmenopausal ER-negative breast cancer among women who, who adhered to the med diet compared to those who did not. So it was an RCT. And I think that that's a pretty interesting study that um, bears paying attention to. There was a large review of cancer in the Mediterranean diet uh, back in 2019. And you know, basically it was just looking at antioxidants, phytonutrients as the basis for helping to improve individuals overall state of well-being. So there again is support for the Mediterranean diet and it is recommended by the ACS, the American Cancer Society. Uh, supplements. Uh, most national cancer organizations don't support the use of dietary supplements, but I think there are some caveats there. Well, especially when it comes to the exceptions of cases of known deficiencies such as low vitamin D, low vitamin B12. We want to correct those. And there's some other instances where maybe supplements could be helpful, such as melatonin for sleep and American ginseng for fatigue. There's some evidence around the benefits for those. I often recommend that patients look for, if they're taking any kind of vitamin supplement, the USP or NSF label, which is an indicator for third-party testing for quality. And um, as we all know, when patients are in active treatment with chemotherapy, some immunotherapies, radiation, we don't want them taking uh, many supplements or some, in some cases, not any at all, and this may be a multivitamin and some vitamin D calcium supplementation because there are known interactions with certain cancer treatments. And um, I know the clinical pharmacists are wonderful for reviewing these with patients and I too can be a resource for that in um, accessing the data that we have around potential interactions. And spirituality, I, I think that that's sometimes an overlooked area. Um, it is a big part of integrative medicine, and I often do try to assess that in patients. And it could be in many different forms, as we know. Many of our patients utilize prayer as part of their connection and feeling of having faith that they will get through their circumstance. Meditation it can be spiritual for many patients, journaling, labyrinth walking. We are so fortunate that right outside of our cancer center, we have this beautiful labyrinth. And I often do recommend for patients to, to try it. It is a wonderful movement meditation and um, accessible to our patients when they come in for their appointments, especially on those nice days, interacting with nature. And then of course, music and art are so important as well. Spirituality and health outcomes, whether maybe a lack of scientific evidence indicating that religion or spirituality impacts cancer progression or remission, it actually has been shown to significantly improve adjustment to cancer diagnosis, symptoms related to the disease and or treatment, and to overall quality of life. And one really interesting study it was way back in 2012, a little over 10 years ago, looked at 29 different studies, and it revealed that individuals with cancer who scored higher on measures of spiritual religious involvement compared to those with lower scores actually had higher odds of surviving their cancer. So um, again, I, I can't, we can't underestimate the power of spirituality and faith. And um, oh, I think this is our last poll. So what are three evidence-based complementary strategies that could be considered for reducing sleep disturbance, depression, and or, and or um, sorry, part of it is kind of blocked um, around cancer patient survivors. So A, meditation, physical exercise, and Ativan, meditation, deep breathing, and Zoloft, meditation, PMR, and yoga, or meditation, deep breathing, exercises, and dessert, particularly chocolate dessert. So I'll give you a moment to uh, answer that. Wonderful. Yeah. I just threw that in there with the chocolate dessert because I think um, chocolate 
have been known to help mood disorders. So, so we could even consider that. When it, it isn't is dark well. chocolate? Isn't there health benefits to dark there chocolate? There are so. absolutely all the antioxidants, phytonutrients in there. There are definite benefits to that, and definitely for mood. So, I guess it could be D as well. So we got a little C and D, but the the, the bigger answer was was C with the evidence around yoga. But thanks, everybody. <laughs> I wish I had chocolate to throw out to Good. everyone. <laughs> Um, So just a friendly reminder, as we get towards the end of our talk, think of your questions for Denise. You can start inserting those um, and typing them out in poll everywhere. And we'll have a few minutes at the end to um, have questions for Denise. Great. Thanks, Tammy. So I think this um, is really the essence of what patients, many of them, are looking for and their providers and remembering that the health of my body, mind, and spirit are related and whomever cares for my health should take that into account. And I have to say one thing came up yesterday with a patient I was talking with. I was um, a little disturbed to hear this, that she used this term. She was very disheartened um, going through her cancer treatments that none of her providers really gave her information about things that she might be able to do to help enhance her overall health and well-being. And that again, that was a word she used, disheartened. She just felt like there were things that maybe she could do, whether it was nutrition or exercise or mindfulness meditation. So um, again, I, I just find that oftentimes providers aren't talking to their patients about some of these integrative modalities. And I'd like to um, encourage everyone to consider this when working with our patients. And I know everybody gets so busy sometimes, but this is just how this particular patient felt going through her treatments when she wanted to have a little bit more empowerment or control of her situation. And I think everybody knows now that the Integrative Lifestyle Medicine Consults are available, and I do provide an individualized approach to care, taking into consideration the whole biopsychosocial aspects that influence a person's health. I provide education offered, um, it's offered on the strategies that we, some of them that we went over, try to connect people with the resources, either at the CCSP or in the community. And, um, I'm sorry, back up. They are available to anyone affected by cancer. It can be at the time of diagnosis, before they even start treatments, during treatments, following treatments, during palliative care. Um, and they're available now four days a week. We went from four hours a week for many, many years to four days a week now, both in-person and virtual options. I see patients in person in the PRFC or the Patient Family Resource Center on Monday for those who wish to come in. And typically the initial consult's an hour and it is covered by insurance as a medical visit. And I certainly offer follow-up appointments for anyone who wishes to check back in. Maybe if I saw them during treatment, they wanna check back in after treatment because it's a different time point for them and they're at a different space. And um, I think everybody knows the referral process now. It's under ambulatory referral and EPIC. Just want to make the distinction. There are two different options because there is a general integrative medicine provider as well through the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab. So if it's a cancer patient's we, patient, we want to make sure it comes through the Department of Psychiatry, UNC Comprehensive Cancer Support Center. And patients can also self-refer. That's another way um, that they can get into C me for a consult. And I know we don't have much time. I just wanted to go briefly through this case study. Uh, KM, 45-year-old diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. She underwent a bilateral mastectomy, radiation, combo chemo, was in the process of reconstructive surgery. She was taking hormonal therapy when we met. Her additional medical history included anxiety, depression, migraines. She was slightly overweight. BMI is 26.6. Married, sadly, her husband had stage four cancer. During this time, she was going through this as well. Um, They had two teenage kids. There was a lot of financial and marital stress going on. And she was seeing a counselor through CCSP, as was her husband. 
She requested an integrative oncology referral for symptom management and overall health and wellness as she was had finished her um, main cancer treatments. She presented with many, many symptoms, fatigue, bone and joint pain, hot flashes, insomnia, weight gain, those cognitive changes, of course, the depression I mentioned, constipation and neuropathy. So just to sum up, some of the recommendations we uh, I gave to her were predominantly plant-based whole foods diet, such as a Mediterranean style diet, and the addition of one to two tablespoons of ground flax per day to help with her constipation. And also it's a great source of omega-3 as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, she was supplemented with vitamin D. Her vitamin D level was low and there does seem to be an association, not saying cause and effect, but an association between low vitamin D and some cancers, breast cancer being included. She, um, <clears throat> was referred for Get Real and Heal. And I'm happy to say she went through that program, loved it, and um, looked great after she completed that program when I saw her later on. Um, Also recommended yoga for stress management, as well as use of aromatherapy with lavender. There is clinical benefit, many studies showing that lavender can help with relaxation with stress. And then acupuncture for her neuropathy, as well as for sleep. And um, other stress-reducing herbal teas, uh, we talked about holy basil. There are some really nice teas that can help with bringing the level of stress down. Um, and melatonin as well for her sleep. And then she was getting continued counseling and just made some other suggestions like around guided imagery, journaling, especially a gratitude journal, which I think is ever so powerful for so many of our patients. And then just some resources, if anybody's interested. And I'll end here. Thank you all so very much for staying with us uh, this afternoon. I know it's a beautiful afternoon out. Um, You probably prefer to be outside. So I do thank you for your attention and being part of this today. And just some references for anyone who would like to look into some of the information on the studies. And then I'll... Just wait and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Denise. This was um, really great. Um, Thank you for sharing your expertise and spending time with us. So our first question coming through is, with many types of integrative treatment options available, is there a consideration for prescribing ones that have higher levels of evidence than others? Yes, of course, when um, talking with patients, it's getting a sense as to what, going back to kind of those patient beliefs and values, where I might recommend acupuncture for someone that have might have, again, that higher level for cancer-related pain or the AI joint pain. Some patients are not going to go for acupuncture. I mean, I've had patients say that they're fearful of needles. They, they wouldn't go anywhere near it. So then we might talk about acupressure. There is some evidence that acupressure can help as well, and it might not be as in, you know, thought of as as invasive for patients. So absolutely, it's coming back to the patient and having that discussion about what might work for them, part of that individualizing. So yeah, thank you for that. Our next question, can you speak briefly on any precautions associated with acupuncture and lymphedema? Yes, that good question. Um, I think as far as for lymphedema, there shouldn't be any um, issues as long as a patient is forthright with talking to their acupuncturist about everything that's going on with them, cancer related. There's some really good acu- acupuncturists, both within, as I mentioned, in UNC and in the community who've worked a lot with cancer patients. So they know what to look out for. And typically the needles aren't going to go into the area of lymphedema anyway. Um, and as far as other precautions, if certainly if somebody is, is neutropenic, um, it, severely neutropenic, we, we wouldn't want them going into a clinic and getting acupuncture as well as if people have bleeding disorders. Um, even though the needles are so, I don't know if you, any of you have ever seen them or had acupuncture, the needles are so fine. They're almost like hair fine, but still that would be a precaution. We'd want to wait until patient's platelet count is um, uh, in a higher range. 
before starting to put needles in. So absolutely, there, there are some precautions. Um, I think integrative medicine is unique in how it empowers patients to participate in and take control of the aspects of their health that are possible. Thanks, Denise, for mm-hmm. all you do. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have any um, to share, any either patient comments you've experienced um, that they have felt empowered or what they have, have done, um, anything to share on that. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, the one that I brought up just happened yesterday. I mean, she just felt as if she was deflated um, by her providers that they didn't feel as though there was anything that she could do to help in her own recovery healing. And um, she actually started looking into, because she wasn't aware at first of the integrative oncology program at UNC and started seeking out other integrative oncology programs because she wanted something to feel empowered, to feel some sense of control um, over her situation. Um, She started looking at University of California in San Francisco, their Usher Integrative Medicine Program, because she'd lived in San Francisco before. And she's like, you know, I saw that program. I'm like, why why isn't there something here? And then someone finally told her about it and CCSP and um, we connected. And, um, you know, I'm glad that she didn't go to another integrative medicine program. But, yeah, that was really important to her. And I hear that so often, especially with the younger breast cancer population, that they want to be active participants. And I shouldn't even say just younger. I mean, I've heard that from older patients as well. I had an 80-some-year-old patient who came looking for ways in which she could improve her health after an endometrial cancer diagnosis. And she said, I just want to do whatever I can to potentially reduce my risk. This this is incredibly important to me. I don't want to sit idle, right? Because I think the belief is that there are things patients can do. And I think the value, again, of integrative medicine, showing some of the evidence for this, um, it's out there. And it's growing. (laughs) So thank you. I think that is all the questions we have. And I know we are at five o'clock. So thank you, Denise. Thank you to all of our attendees and hanging with us tonight. Thank you to the University Cancer Research Fund, to the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Mm -hmm. Center, and the Lineberger Cancer Network. And a huge thank you to our telehealth team. They are behind the scenes, but making all this magic happen. Um, thank you to Benny, John, Oliver, Andrew, Nadja, and Patrick. So don't forget about all of our series. There are lots of great topics and learning opportunities, free continuing education. So our upcoming live webinars, um, the research to practice on rectal cancer, our Southeastern American Indian cancer health, um, and then patient-centered care on lymphedema. And um, our next APP session is on oral chemotherapy. Our self-paced online courses, go check them out if you miss them. And thank you all. Um, Please hang on till the webinar is closed. And we appreciate your time and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.